violence, more specifically murder, is one of the oldest sins. St. Vincent de Grenadines, with a little over 110,000 people, has seen its fair share of not only violent murders, but unsolved killings that have left communities and relatives in shock and police baffled. I am teaming up with Searchlight to examine cold cases where all investigative leads available to police have been exhausted and the case remains unsolved. My hope is that any new potential leads can spur renewed interest by police and bring some closure to families of the deceased. Godwin Fobbs, a popular businessman considered to be one of the country's best locksmiths, is gunned down in the dead of night in a community not known for criminal activity. We jump back almost three decades to see if we can find clues as to who delivered the fatal shots and why. St. Vincent Grenadines is a country teeming with beautiful beaches, rivers, mountains and people who love to party. But under all that beauty exists evil that sometimes rears its ugly head. Dorsetshire Hill is a community located just a short distance outside capital Kingston. In this residential area, home to several affluent families, residents were as usual immersed in their daily activities. School children were enjoying the summer break and people were seeking relief from hot days and even hotter nights. But the calm and safety of suburbia was about to be shattered. As unknown to residents, a murderous plot was being cooked up. The intended target had no idea that his last day was approaching. Forbes had been associated with the McConney Yami supermarket located at Granby Street in Kingston. In addition to offering business services to the popular supermarket, it is said that Forbes was romantically involved with his proprietor, Victoria Yami. On the night of August 25, 1995, sometime after 9 p.m., Forbes went to the Yami property. His killer must have known that this is where he would be on that Friday night, and they must have also known that Forbes was assisting Victoria with managing the Yami's multi-million dollar estate and that she was overseas at the time. Forbes died that night, right at the spot where he was ambushed. It was not until the morning of Saturday, August 26, that Forbes' body was discovered by a man by the name of Bull a longtime friend of the Yami family. News quickly spread through the community that the presiding chairman of the Solomon Cloisters Lodge and a well-respected businessman, Godwin Forbes, was dead. 
Initial reports said that Forbes had been beaten to death, but police were later disclosed that he had been shot and residents reported hearing several gunshots that night. The question swirling around in everyone's mind is, why was Forbes killed? Was this a crime of passion or was it a robbery gone wrong? Forbes was a locksmith for several prominent businesses including banks. Perhaps his killers believed that cases he carried contained large sums of money. Forbes' large colleague and close friend, Deacon Ken Lewis, joined Searchlight to retrace the events leading up to Forbes' murder. Godwin had trained to be a locksmith while he was at sea. Because it was at the time that he was planning to retire from the sea. So he, he got trained, he trained himself to, to come back and be meaningfully employed. Soon after that, Godwin returned to St. Vincent and was fit, fatally killed. What do I remember of that? I got a call early that morning saying that Godwin was dead and his body was lying somewhere at Dossett Trail. As Lewis remembered the image of Fabulous bullet ridden body, laying in the yard, it was evident to him that whoever pulled the trigger was determined to end Forbes' life. I travelled there and discovered that he had been shot several times. The wound that I remember, there was a wound to his, his jaw and there was a wound in his back and he was lying on the pavement there, uh, dead. Was it, was it in the yard of the property? In the yard of the property. I think that property was... Uh, yummy. Yeah, yeah. So, the police came by and they did what they had to do. And we got no information as to who or why or what. But he was buried in the churchyard, St. George's. Godwin's cash was in the bank. I've got another job for you. Uh, he did the job for you. He, he took whatever cash he, he turned him. But the bank was next morning. While Lewis had cast a robbery to your side, Others close to Forbes have not been able to shake the belief that the killer was after Forbes' money. For Paul Yami, son of Victoria Yami, Forbes' death has left him mourning a father figure. He has spent years speculating that the robbery was the motive for Forbes' killing. Godwin Forbes, uh, he was like a father to me. Um, he was a close friend of the family, close friend of my mom. Um, at that time, of his death, I was living in the States, going to school in America. And woke up one morning, got a call from St. Vincent and said that he's home in my yard died. Quiet individual, you don't have no problems with people, you know, does a locksmith business. Um, you have no kids, live by yourself, you know. Uh, know him as a large member, uh, sailed for years on the bulk ship. You know, spent a lot of years out there in the bulk ship, came back home, you know, lived by himself, never had a wife, you know, that's a quiet individual. And, uh, you know, it was shocking for, to hear such news. You know, I was about uh, 18 or 19 years old at that time when it happened. I really missed him, you know, I really, really missed him, you know, I really missed him. I, uh, sometimes you remember back a lot of stuff that he used to tell you back then, you know, stay out of trouble, you know. They, they treated it out as a, as, as a robbery. It, it looked as a robbery, you know. They came and they, they met him right across the section right here. He had uh, two pans that he got from the bank, from working with the bank for, for, the, for the years, doing locksmith work for the banks. He had these two pans that he always carried around. I don't know if the individual thought that he had money in those pans, you know. But when we, when we got here, when the police got here, they found the, 
two pans lying on the ground there with open up like you know you, you probably search them to see what they have there. What what, 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 what you keys. Keys and tools to fix um, locks and so forth. Searchlight's quest to uncover the motive for Fabs' death got even more complicated when I interviewed a resident from Dorsetshire Hill who remembered the shooting death vividly. While they declined to be interviewed on camera, the resident told Searchlight persons believed that the killer was not interested in Fabs' personal money but what influence he might have wielded from being in a relationship with Victoria. They found his wallet on the ground full of money and his keys. So whoever killed him was not interested in his wallet. To us the resident, this was more of an assassination. People in the area have theories about who would have done it, but nobody wants to call name. People ain't gonna call nobody name. This comes as a surprise to us. And the mere fact that they did not take his wallet, they was not interested in, in his money. This was more than just a robbery. And this is surprising to us. What we need to know is what was the motive. During search test investigation, we discovered that police questioned one of their own during the murder inquiry, but nothing came of this lead. Other suspects were also fingered in the robbery theory, including Andrew Judge Bowens and a man by the name of Curtis Jackson. Other names also came up on the Forbes' murder suspect radar, Cyprian Dublin and Zero Flex Harry, but their involvement was never confirmed. Coincidentally, Bowens, Dublin and Harry are all dead with their killings also being unsolved murder cases. Almost three decades have passed since Fabs' death, now a cold case, filed away in a police cabinet with no justice served for his killer or his family. The approach by police to the investigation has come under scrutiny from those close to Forbes who, to this day, are still plagued with questions. During our investigation, search that made several attempts for a comment from police, but they were not open to interviews. And I think too at that time too, when that murder took place, I didn't think that the uh, police system was that upgraded. Even, uh, even today, and still not, but you know, at that time, um, I didn't think they did too much investigation on it. I was, I, was, I was quite hurt. I was quite hurt, one that they didn't call nobody. You know, uh, uh, we, up to today, we have um, had a rest of justice in it. You know, um, as I say, it still remain as a cold case. I still don't feel comfortable about the situation. It still, it still plays in the mind at times, you know. It still plays in the mind at times, you know, what, what lead up to this. You know, um, you know, as, as you say, you know, many TVs, um, but uh, I, I, at times, at times it do, it do, it do comes back. You do, get, you do get flashbacks of it. I mean, I'm living in the compound where it happened, you know, and um, you know, at, at times it do plays back. The method used to end his life is also an eyebrow-raising part of the story, considering that killings by way of the gun were almost unheard of in the mid 1990s. I think Godwin's death struck a chord because we were not so open to, to, to murders and that kind of thing. I don't think that there was a, a, a prevalence of firearms. I mean, every Tutman Bagai today has a, a firearm. It is highly unlikely that new evidence that will help solve Forbes' murder would ever be unearthed. But persons with information can still come forward. This is Life Compton for Cold Case St. Vincent and the Grenadines. But who shot Godwin or who killed Godwin, we, we don't, don't know. know.